fantastic. We have two fantastic speakers today joining us from Red Sea Farms LLC. And shortly they will talk about uh, their uh, company uh, and their technology and how they are addressing the challenges in uh, marginal uh, environments. Um, before I uh, introduce them to you, I would like to encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A window uh, during the presentation. Please, uh, I will do my very best to direct your questions to our speakers after their uh, presentation. And thank you once again for joining us today. And thank you in advance for your active participation. Um, before we start the presentations, I would like to uh, encourage you to join us for our upcoming hydroponic uh, tomato intensive workshop uh, with our uh, instructor, Dr. Tristan Hooks uh, during January 7th, 8th and 9th. This will be an online and on-site workshop for those who are interested in learning about hydroponic crop production in greenhouse settings. So we have limited seats. Please register. You see the link here uh, on the screen. And I, uh, I'll ask Ellen's help to maybe paste that, um, copy that link in the chat window for you uh, if you are interested in joining us. And then I also encourage you to join us uh, for our 21st annual Greenhouse Production and Engineering Design Short Course. This will be a hybrid course again, workshop um, during March 7th, 8th and 9th, as we will bring expertise from academia and industry to talk about fundamentals of engineering and crop production in greenhouses, as well as in vertical farming settings. So with that, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce you our two guest speakers for today's webinar. Uh, I will start with Dr. Mark Tester. Dr. Mark Tester is a professor of plant science at King Abdullah Science University and Technology, KAUST. And he is the associate director of the Center for Desert Agriculture and co-founder and chief scientist of Red Sea Farms, LLC. In 2019, uh, Mark was head of the food sector of NEOM. And prior to joining to KAUST back in 2013, he was an ARC Federation Fellow and Professor of Plant Physiology at the University of Adelaide, uh, where he also established the Plant Accelerator. Previously, he was a Senior Lecturer at the University of Cambridge, where he also received his PhD in 1988. Mark is now enjoying developing saltwater-based agricultural systems to improve sustainability of food production. And next, Dr. Ryan Lefers. Uh, Ryan is the co-founder and CEO of Red Sea Farms. Ryan holds a BS and MS degree in agricultural engineering from South Dakota State University and a PhD in environmental engineering from KAUST, where he also serves as a research scientist with the Center of Desert Agriculture. Prior to uh, his roles uh, at KAUST, uh, and also with Red Sea Farms, Ryan spent time as a professor with Texas A&M University and also as an environmental engineering consultant. As a professional engineer and researcher, uh, uh, Ryan also uh, is interested uh, working with sustainable uh, controlled environment agriculture systems. And he brings his expertise uh, to the complex interactions between food, energy and water issues within controlled environment agriculture uh, settings. And his inventions have resulted in patents focused on mainly cooling, air purification, water and energy savings, and systems optimization for CEA. Ryan and Matt, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. And stage is yours. All right, well, thank you, Marat, for that kind introduction. So I'm Ryan, uh, and I'll be starting our session today. Let me just share my screen. Uh, hopefully it comes through all right. So I'll be talking a bit today about, really, this is a story, and I'm going to try to tell the story of how we started. 
really from our roots at KAUST and the research and sort of innovations that Mark and I have been working on collectively uh, in different disciplines and then how that came together um, in Red Sea Farms and what we're doing today. So that's the focus for today. So really the story starts here around the need for innovation as it relates to water. So as you look at the, the planet today, about 70% of our global fresh water is used for agriculture. Um, and we are tapping those resources hard. Uh, you know, global aquifer levels are going down. There's increasing demand, increasing populations. And in spite of that, you know, 97% of all of Earth's available water is actually salt water. So here in Red Sea Farms, what we've done is we've taken, you know, recognizing that need um, Mark is a plant scientist. I'm an agriculture engineer. And so we've put those two disciplines together to look at um, how can we use really salt water uh, to, to fuel agriculture systems. And in addition, we've also added team members, and I'll share Darius' photograph in a second, around how can we use the sun better as well, with the goal of providing sustainable, secure, and commercially viable desert produce, or really just produce in general, with the target of using salt water and sunlight. So, you know, as we put also the other context around challenges to food systems, you have this big challenge around sustainability. Um, so, you know, 50% of habitable land is used and it's not increasing. Uh, we already talked about the water use. The CO2 emissions from agriculture are staggering and really, um, a major sort of player in the global uh, greenhouse gas emission landscape. In addition, we need to increase food production. So, you know, based on current rates, we estimate we need to grow by about 30% by 2050. And a big part of this will be enabling local food production, especially as you look at food supply chain and the challenges there and the challenges in transportation. So we're from Saudi Arabia and you know we saw major challenges during the pandemic around bringing food in to a you know a desert country and things like the Suez Canal blockage and and these major like increases in transportation costs but the fact remains that it's a challenge to produce food in harsh climates um, especially in water scarce regions so really uh, at Red Sea Farms, what we're trying to do is build these scalable and these sustainable desert agriculture systems powered by salt water and sunlight. And really the focus of that again is to feed the world in a sustainable way. Um, and we wanna make our contribution to that. So Mark and I started Red Sea Farms back in 2018. Uh, you know, Mark's a long time plant salinity tolerance expert. Um, so he's the food guy. Uh, I come from a water background, and then we've also added in a team, uh, Iris, that's now part of Red Sea Farm. So Professor Derry Baran really comes in as a material scientist with a specialist in energy. So there's the food, water, energy nexus there among our founders. Um, and we've been working at, at KAUST um, actually almost nine years now. And these are really innovations that have spun out of our research at KAUST. And we still have a lot of support um, and really thankful for um, the opportunity that we have at KAUST um, and the support we've got there. But again, these are around using saltwater and sunlight um, and really engineering and plant science. So this is a look at our wider team. So we're not just engineers and scientists. We have some great business talents as well on the team. Um, and we've got about 40 people now within Red Sea Farms and I'll show you some of our sites in the Middle East, and then I'll talk about some of our global ambitions as well. So again, if we focus back on the hard problem, it's this problem of how do you feed people, you know, about a, over a billion already living in desert regions in an environmentally and commercially sustainable way in light of these big challenges, heat, humidity, the lack of fresh water, making sure that you have consistency in quality and supply, um, and then also the normal challenges around pests and pathogens. So here's just a snapshot uh, to, to benchmark again. So if you, if you benchmark a greenhouse in uh, Saudi Arabia, a traditional desert greenhouse, 
This is work that comes out of our colleagues at Esti Dama and Riyadh. They've said it takes about 350 liters of fresh water per kilogram of tomatoes. Um, and then you can benchmark as well the, the energy use in that, and then a capex for that system. You could move to a mechanically cooled greenhouse. Again, we're, we're talking in our local Middle East environment, significantly less fresh water because you're able to recycle that humidity, but a significant increase in energy use. And most of that would be coming from the burning of fossil fuels to, to power electricity. And then what, we've, what we're looking at is providing a system, a uh, controlled environment agriculture system with a primary input of salt water and sunlight with a significantly lower freshwater footprint uh, compared to traditional greenhouses and also significantly lower energy footprint. And I'll show you some of the technologies that we're implementing and that are you know, um, playing a part in this system. So this is sort of a, an overview of um, a greenhouse. So this is just a, a section view. Um, of course, greenhouses vary in terms of what systems they've used. But we've got a number of different um, technologies that are part of this mix, including intelligent use of the sunlight, whether that's through heat blocking or solar PV, uh, as well as cooling systems using desiccants or salt water, um, and then also uh, the salt tolerant crops. So, and really, what this delivers in, in the intention and the long term goal for this is to deliver a system that can produce food, uh, for example, cherry tomatoes saving about 75 liters of water per cup of cherry tomatoes compared to what else is on the shelf uh, but also you know as a as a total system saving up to 95 percent of that fresh water and 90 percent of the grid energy uh, compared to a traditional greenhouse and also doing it locally so you don't have this air miles of flying in food uh, so that's that's a snapshot of the system and we'll dig into some of these technologies so really the technologies fall into three main buckets. Uh, one is around active cooling. A second one is around passive cooling, which is really the, the energy and the light management. And the third one, which Mark will talk about is around the salt tolerant crops. And so you see there a, a snapshot of our technology stack as we call it, or our platform. Um, and these are technologies that can be included in the, the total system depending on the local climate and, and what you need. So we do things like saltwater evaporative cooling. Um, that's been done by others. You can look up like seawater greenhouse or Sahara Forest Project. We have our own liquid desiccant night chilling system. So that's a, that's a system that we have a patent on um, that really stores solar energy in a, in a thermal form and a, so that we can deploy cooling quickly at night. Humidity capture and reuse. Um, this also provides some air purification, photovoltaic connected fans. We have uh, building integrated photovoltaics. We have a glass that blocks infrared, and I'll show you some of the results of that. And we have a light that's in its early stages um, that's a adaptive low energy light system. Then Mark will talk a bit about the crops, and then we tie this all together with a system that we call Cortex, which is what we've developed in-house for controlling this and sensing. So as you look at sort of the growing challenges that we've identified, really each of these technologies is designed to address one or more of the key growing challenges. And the way that we're designing our technologies is that these can be incorporated either into new or existing structures. Uh, so we're designing these in a way so that they can be bolted on to existing structures to enable rapid and scalable deployment, not just for new builds, but also for retrofit and upgrade. So that's really the targets of these different technologies. So again, as we think about like what sort of systems might be able to benefit from this, there's the salt affected open fields or, or greenhouse soils where they're growing in the soil. Um, there's areas with brackish irrigation water or um, low quality irrigation water sort of all different types and sizes of greenhouses. So we've, we've been testing our technology on anything from a low-tech uh, polyethylene sort of tunnel up to mid-tech polycarbonate and even into high-tech glass for new and existing builds. And again, so we can do this with evaporative cooling using really any type of salt water um, in hot and humid locations, 
because of the liquid desiccants that help us to control humidity. Um, these enable us to do humid locations, which is really important for most of our coastal communities where uh, generally near the coast, it's humid. Uh, so if you want to tap into seawater, you really need to also be able to deal with humidity. And we've also been working to make the systems function on or off grid. Um, and we're also looking at uh, applying this into livestock systems as well. So including uh, things like poultry, where we see a major advantage from air purification in addition to humidity capture and reuse. So here's just a snapshot. This is the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you'll see the, uh, the arrow on the left in the north. That's our greenhouse on the campus of Ingabella University of Science and Technology. That's our R&D greenhouse. Um, four compartments there that we can do uh, comparison trials of the different technologies. Um, we've also installed or have plans to install portions of our different technology stack at multiple sites across the peninsula from coast to coast. So this is a snapshot as of where those technologies were already installed or being installed in, this is from August of 2021. And we've added some additional sites now in the UAE um, and also now coming to North America um, in Arizona. So this is a snapshot of the Kaust campus. You can actually see, so this is a beautiful uh, uh, sunset shot here. The green arrow identifies where we've got that, that R&D greenhouse for testing and um, scale up of our technologies. You also see some of the open fields in the foreground where Mark's doing some testing of some of the salt tolerant plants. Um, and then the university campuses in the upper right corner, sort of behind there, that's where the labs are. And that's where these innovations really spun out of was our work in the lab. Um, and of course, you can see uh, just a piece of the Red Sea there. Uh, so the, the university is right on the Red Sea, uh, a very salty body of water. Um, saltier, for those of you who haven't uh, been there, um, it's saltier than the oceans. Um, so it's at about 45 thousand parts per million as compared to 30 to 35, which we would expect in the oceans. Um, so it's a very salty body of water, uh, but a giant resource and a sustainable resource for us to use. Um, so that's really the target is to take advantage of those resources. And of course, we have the sunlight illuminating, the free sunlight illuminating this photo. So we're trying to take advantage of that as well. So I'll talk a bit about like uh, our sort of buckets of technology here, and then I'll transfer it to Mark. So the active cooling piece here, again, we talked about sun and the salt water, our targets here to save a lot of water, fresh water that is, which in our context comes from um, desalination, exclusively, at least on campus. Uh, so that really means energy savings because in desalination, it's an energy input in addition to the energy savings for the, the, the cooling of the covered agriculture system. And then being able to supply that food locally with zero air miles, uh, which significant carbon footprint savings as well as just um, security of food supply. So there's three main active cooling systems. We talked a bit about the saltwater evaporative cooling. So these are, uh, that's on the left there. So these are sort of some monthly averages. This is in Celsius. You can see sort of the, uh, from an annual basis. So the graph starts uh, in, in, in March, it ends, um, it goes through um, June. So you can see how we have a very warm summer hot, some would say, I would say very hot. Uh, and then we have a very mild winter. And so with evaporative cooling of seawater, we can, we can get temperature reduction, usually around six degrees Celsius. It's not great as evaporative cooling goes, but it's because of that humidity. Um, and so you see, you know, this is a test that we ran for about four years on the university campus. Um, and these are, you know, sort of a compilation of those results. As you switch into, so I just highlighted humidity as a major challenge in the coastal environment. So this is where the liquid desiccant uh, night chiller really came out of was we saw this need. So as you look at the, 
the temperature there. So I've drawn a, a, a red line at 30 degrees Celsius. And the little um, yellow dots there are what we can achieve with evaporative cooling in some of our most challenging months, which is really August and September uh, on the coast of the Red Sea. And what you'll see is that evaporative cooling is sufficient to keep your daytime temperature at or below around 30 degrees Celsius. But if you want to chill at night, which is really critical for the health of, of the plants uh, that we're trying to grow, it's just not possible with evaporative cooling in that context because of the high humidity that we have. And I can tell you, having lived there, uh, uh, sometimes I actually prefer going out in the day as opposed to the night because it's so humid, it's stifling. Uh, and so our real target is to be able to drop that temperature with an alternative cooling system uh, at night down much lower. So, you know, here the target is 22 degrees, um, but this is done using a, a large thermal battery. So it's a big tank of liquid desiccant that we chill during the day using solar power. Uh, and that stores that cooling energy um, to be able to deploy right at sunset and to drop the temperature quickly uh, and then to maintain it over the night before the sun comes up again to enable more photosynthesis. So that's the target of the, the liquid desiccant based night chilling system, which again is designed to be an off grid like thermal energy storage system that we can deploy for both temperature and humidity control. Uh, moving to the last of the active cooling systems here. So we have the system we call the HUMCAP, humidity capture and reuse. And this is really designed for more um, non-humid areas. And the idea is that this functions as a, a latent heat exchanger. So it captures humidity as it's exiting the greenhouse or any controlled environment, which would have otherwise just be blown into the atmosphere. And uh, it captures a portion of that and it returns it back to the entrance of the greenhouse or any controlled environment to sort of pre-cool in an evaporative cooling sense before the other sort of main evaporative cooler. So you're just reducing the, the load on your evaporative cooler. So we're doing some tests with this right now um, at the, you know, the full sort of scale of about 500 square meters. Um, we're still waiting on the results, to be honest. Based on models, we think we can save up to about 70% of the total evaporative cooling water use. Um, and we're just getting some of that data in now to, to validate some of those assumptions. The other thing about this system that um, actually is really interesting for primarily livestock producers is that because liquid desiccants are very, very salty, um, they have the uh, potential to remove pathogens from the incoming air. Um, so we've combined that with the with additional uh, sanitation step to really get, and we're getting great results from this in the lab, remove viruses, bacteria, um, spores uh, from the incoming air. Uh, and this is a really big deal, especially as you think about um, like livestock producers and poultry, but think about the avian flu and um, the impact that that had both here in the US back in 2015. Uh, and then also we had a big effect in Saudi Arabia, like billions of dollars lost uh, due to the death of, of chickens. And, and think about the resource impact of that as well, the resources that went into that. So we see a lot of potential, especially for that hum cap system um, in, in livestock systems, as well as greenhouses. So moving on a bit from the active cooling systems, this is the passive cooling and really all the credit for this work belongs to, to Daria and, and her group. And, and I'll present about it and I'll share some of the results, but this is really their work. So as you look at the solar spectrum, you've got the UV, the photosynthetic active radiation, far, uh, and the near infrared. And that near infrared spectrum it contributes to significant heat load within your covered environments. So the target here is really just to reduce that near infrared from and block it from entering the, the covered environment. So, so that's the target here. Um, again, this is gonna save energy because we'll have to do less cooling. Uh, we'll have to also, you know, if, if it's a cooler environment, then the plants are gonna transpire less. We're gonna do less cooling with evaporative cooling. So we're gonna save energy and water um, of course, we're targeting a longer growing season, so we're going to be able to control that environment better. 
Um, and then also, you know, reduce risk of crop failure, again, because of thermal control. So we want to, of course, um, increase the ideas that other than deploying, there's a lot of systems you would deploy like a, a shade to help both with heating uh, and cooling, as well as depending on the crop, you would do it for the crop needs. But a lot of times the shades are just deployed for just to try to keep the greenhouse cool. Well, if you're growing a crop like tomatoes, where you have a direct yield response to and you know more light, more par, then we would like to not be able or not have to do that. And so by blocking the NIR, uh, the idea is we'd get more total par over the course of the day to get increase in yield. And then of course, trending towards a net energy zero greenhouse. So this is a technology, it's a polymer that you can apply either as a coating. So we're right now we're doing things like painting or spraying on, uh, it can also be applied as a film um, or it can be integrated into the covering material itself. And this is like a sheet. So we're looking at all different ways of incorporating this into the covering material. Um, for both new build and sort of um, retrofit or upgrade applications. So these are actually results from one of our early uh, tests. This is, these are results from about two years ago. Um, we have more recent stuff, but you know, it's still um, under patent protection. So I'm just showing you some of the old stuff, but you see the target here really. So the yellow is some of the results from that, that early material and you see good transmission in the visible and the UV, the PAR range, and you see the blocking as you move out into that NIR compared to, if you compare the yellow and the green, we're getting significant reduction in the NIR as a result of this covering. And that as a result, a significant reduction in the amount of cooling that you have to do in the greenhouse itself. So it's a passive cooling system. I shared some of the other technologies and I won't get into details on these, but these are other parts of our technology stack that are in either in development or you know commercially uh, available, and we're putting them in because they're a good fit as part of the system. So, um, sort of the, the the first one here on the upper left hand side. Um, this is the um, the heat blocking, which we already talked about. So, you know, that would go on the roof, of course. Zone two is like sort of your, your storage areas or your packing areas, your office areas of the facility, where you can just integrate uh, roof mounted photovoltaics. Um, so you can, you can put photovoltaics on the roof. Of course, that generates energy that you can use in your system. Uh, so the zone three here, it's talking about the lights. So we have these um, early, early stage uh, lighting systems that are adaptive. Um, that are directly connected to the solar PV. Um, and these can help us increase a certain spectra that we want for um, additional yield. And then in zone four, you have uh, a technology which we're really excited about. It's still, again, at early stage, but we're gonna be deploying it at about 200 square meters in January. It's a, a system that actually um, takes that near infrared and it doesn't just block it, but it actually converts it to energy. And so we get an electricity output as well from that, that heat blocking. Um, so that's, that's also very exciting and it's coming. And it's at this stage that I turn it over to Professor Mark Tester uh, to talk about the saltwater tolerance for us. So take uh -huh. it away, Mark. <laughs> Cheers. So how many hours have you left me? Right. <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes plants. So thanks for the opportunity to talk here. Uh, I'm a plant guy and uh, have spent most of my career working with um, understanding mechanisms of salinity tolerance. A lot of that has been applied or directed towards increasing the salinity tolerance of crops that are already out there, making wheat a bit more salt tolerant or barley a bit more salt tolerant. That works fine. I'm not ashamed of it, but I think that we can do, and, and we still continue to do some of that, I should say, but I think we've got real step change opportunities in improving our ability to grow plants on very, very salty water, like seriously saline water. If we have a, um, a program of work to domesticate 
a plant which are already growing in the sea, such as salicornium. Um, the other crop which we're also doing quite a lot of work on are tomatoes. And this is um, because, of course, tomatoes are a very important greenhouse crop. They're the biggest horticultural crop um, in the world and uh, provide some good nutrition. They could provide better nutrition. I think that's another area of research that should be increased. But uh, they, good, they do provide good nutrition and have already got a fairly reasonable degree of salinity tolerance. And what we're trying to do is, is actually greatly increase that salinity tolerance of tomatoes. Not quite by getting tomatoes that grow in seawater because there aren't any, unfortunately, that exist uh, that, that at least I've been able to find and work on, but at least that have got very high levels of salinity tolerance. And we can use grafting um, to, uh, to develop salt tolerant uh, plants. So these research with salt tolerant rootstocks has been um, progressing very well. And we're now in um, trials in fields and in greenhouses to try to um, improve those um, rootstocks. Uh, I should say that in the greenhouse system, Ryan said it uh, very clearly, uh, but I like to emphasize it. A lot of our salt tolerant plant work attracts attention but in the greenhouse system, it really is the engineering which provides by far and away the greatest contribution to the savings of fresh water. Um, 90%, at least, in the, at least in the environments that we're targeting, the, uh, the dry, hot, dry environments and hot, humid environments that Ryan's been describing. But even so, the plants can make some con a small contribution towards water saving. But in open fields, it's very different. And so we can actually have the plants and improving the salinity tolerance of these crops really can have huge contributions to the freshwater consumption in open fields. So we have here additional saltwater systems in development. We've got a, a, a basket of crops, um, which is uh, nothing that's too radical. It's hard work, of course, and it's building, drawing very much on work such as done here um, in the University of Arizona, but in many other places around the world as well. Uh, we're also developing salt tolerant grain crops. That's primarily referring to work uh, we've been doing with quinoa. Quinoa is a crop from the, uh, from the Andes, which has got uh, already high intrinsic salinity tolerance. It's been partially domesticated. It needs more domestication with a lot of traits changed, but also the critical weakness for working in hot margin environments, critical weakness of quinoa is it's sensitive to heat. And so we're using wild relatives of quinoa, which are growing in very hot environments in northwestern Argentina and uh, introducing those heat tolerance genes into domesticated quinoa. There are also many other areas of work which uh, we can, which we are developing um, in our research and in the company, uh, such as salt tolerant fodder for livestock, landscape um, plants, trees, uh, which can be grown using uh, a lot saltier water than would be normally the case. Um, we also have their written salt tolerant fuel crops. Um, I think this is mainly referring to our salicornia work, but for me, salicornia, the primary target for salicornia is undoubtedly the oil that it's able to, to produce, but uh, I think I'd rather see that oil being used um, for higher value purposes than, uh, than, than biofuels. Uh, I, I really don't think that's a good use of salicornia, uh, but we can use it for, for cooking oil. It has properties that are very similar to sunflower oil, and um, it's also got good properties um, in high-speed engines as a lubricant oil, and that could be another, I think, economically sound use of that uh, particular product. The last one on this slide, we have seawater algae systems. Uh, that's still in our, in our plans. Uh, we haven't done any active work yet, but if anybody wants to make a real contribution to reducing carbon footprint in our agricultural systems, growing algae, which are able to suppress the generation of methane in the digestive systems of ruminants could be a very, very significant contribution. And I'd actually love us to be able to, 
to do some of that. It's you know something I would feel passionately about. We just haven't had the hours in the day yet to uh, to, to to activate that work. Um, it, we are we are nibbling around at it, but yeah, that's something we really want to do. So Red Sea Farms, um, we 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 are taking a couple of steps back from that previous slide. We are growing tomatoes. Um, the produce over the last three, four months is about 20 tonnes a week, I think. It's in that order. It's easing back at the moment as we're doing a changeover in some of our systems, but it's, uh, it's, it's substantial. We have six hectares of greenhouse and um, um, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're on the way as, as, as a company, which is, which is great. Um, in particular, when you grow tomatoes with a little bit of seawater in the, in the growth medium, you find a, an increase in the quality of the fruits. So they're a lot sweeter, you get a much higher bricks, you get a much higher vitamin C content, uh, you get a, a, a lower pH, so it's more acid, so you get a sweet and sour flavor, which humans love. And the fourth feature um, of these fruits, which uh, affect the quality, it's an interesting one that the fruits often get a slightly tougher skin. So some people in the market don't like that, some people do, retailers universally love it because um, it increases the shelf life of the fruits and consumers damn well should like that as well because it reduces waste um, but uh, this is a, a really good dimension to these uh, these plants we're growing quite a few other crops and as we mature and as we take on more um, jobs if you like with other um, with other customers and partners uh, we're, we are greatly diversifying the, the, the portfolio of crops we grow. Okay, so moving out into the field um, where I do think the plant science can have significant, more significant contributions in terms of environmental footprints. Um, we have been developing these root stocks and uh, we're now doing field trials. It's one of the reasons we're here in Arizona because we think it's a good target environment to be also testing these tomatoes. So if anybody out there watching wants a job, We'll be hiring um, as we try to ramp up our, our work here in the coming um, months um, in this area. So we've currently got field trials with a fantastic collaborator in the far north of Egypt. Talk about an environmental disaster. <laughs> Travelling the world, you see things. You go to Senegal, you see disasters. You go to northern Egypt, um, many places. Pakistan is, a, is an amazing country that's really really unsustainably exploiting their water resources. Um, yeah, at any rate, northern Egypt, uh, you have a lot of small farmers, uh, small holding. Um, they have no choice but to reuse the same land. You're up in Egypt, you've got none of the land. And so you end up with a buildup of salinity in the soil, a buildup of, um, of pests and diseases, uh, nematodes in particular. And so we've got some, some really, it's, uh, I'm very happy, uh, really some very interesting rootstocks, which um, are looking to be really helping uh, maintain yields in these difficult soils. So the lower panel, you can see the field trial uh, that we had last season, which is during the summer, believe it or not, in northern Egypt. Uh, and this is a photograph of our collaborator, Mohamed Raka, who's a professor at Kaprosche University. And of course, when you're working with academic collaborators, uh, you get students, uh, wonderful students who are working in the field. It's good for them, it's good for us, it's a win-win. And so we're, uh, this happens to be a photograph of a grafting cucumber, actually, right? <laughs> you should change that. But uh, this is at a grafting company in Northern Egypt. And uh, in fact, there's a story in this. Um, I better move on. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. The, the grafting, I think, has got massive opportunities for rapid uh, development of interesting and powerful genetic material. And I think with crops like tomatoes, and cucumbers, uh, you really can have accelerated breeding. And uh, to me, it's a very exciting opportunity. So we're, of course, commercializing this. I've already mentioned that we've got um, sales of products now into the, into the market, at least in Saudi Arabia and soon elsewhere and uh, in the open fields the markets are, um, are really quite substantial um, 
because of the vast number of plants of tomatoes, just stick to tomatoes for the moment, which are grown um, and planted in fields every season. And one of the reasons they're not grown more as grafted plants in fields is because of the cost of seed. So this is something, especially when you're in a margin environment, the, the farmer's only getting one, two dollars worth of tomatoes back out. So you really have to keep the costs of the, of the front end of the crop as low as possible. And a, a, a currently a standard rootstock seed, you know, a seed of maxi fort, depending how you source it and your purchasing power, that costs 20 to 30 cents for each seed. And so one of our aims is to reduce that by a factor of 10. Okay, so, and we think we can. So we have engineering, we have plant science, and then we stitch it together um, using some of these very powerful technologies um, in the um, IT space, uh, machine learning, the internet of things uh, are, are really too, too real, very real and increasingly applicable uh, softwares. In fact, in some ways, I love my plant science, I love the, the engineering, but in many ways, a lot of this IT uh, can be very, very powerful and also quite rapidly developed and deployed. So uh, we have here the system which has been developed inside Red Sea Farms, we call a Cortex, it's sort of the, the new brain of the greenhouse, uh, which provides us with, you know, on our phone, access to the site uh, for uh, understanding what's going on, knowing what's going on in the greenhouse uh, uh, in real time. And that can really help with rapid decision making. And of course, there's alert systems, uh, which are easily implemented you really can uh, be made actively aware of problems in your greenhouse. And time is often of the essence. In many places in rural areas, you have low reliability of power and you really only need the power off for um, uh, 20, 30 minutes in our environment and you can lose your crop. You can lose $100,000 worth of crop in, in an hour and that's not good. So uh, with Cortex, that's one real strong advantage. But of course, it's much more sophisticated than that. And what's exciting about Cortex is it's going to only get more sophisticated every week. It gets better, not just because of new algorithms being uh, folded in, but because of the accumulation of data. And from that data, we can start having learnings. And so we're able to start having machine learning, improving our ability to make decisions to help the growers and the managers uh, make smarter decisions faster. Um, it also, of course, helps with remote control um, of, our, of cooling systems and all sorts of other aspects of the greenhouse, such as shading, fertigation, and so on. So we really are, um, in, uh, I think this, this, is, this is in many ways a significant part of the future. Um, we're already rolling this out into, into various greenhouses, mid-tech and high-tech greenhouses, uh, greenhouses which are Red Sea Farms greenhouses or ones which we're um, doing for third party customers. And these are just showing some of the, uh, the features in a little bit more detail. Okay, we've been going for 42 minutes. So just uh, it's time to start time to wrap. Uh, these are some of the more of the deployments in, in Saudi Arabia. Okay, so just to summarize, Brian presented at the beginning summary of some of the, um, the, the challenges, the environmental challenges, which uh, we face out there in, the, in some of these hostile environments. And uh, we really are developing systems that are developed in those hostile environments for those hostile environments. And I think this can have a wide range of um, positive impacts, impacts on the environment where we're reducing freshwater consumption without increasing energy consumption, in fact, reducing energy consumption, if anything, increasing the ability to grow locally and thus reduce uh, food air miles. When we're talking about horticultural crops, usually having to fly these things around the place, unlike the staples, like the cereals, our daily bread, you can move that in ships and store it for a long time, but you can't for most horticultural crops. And the carbon dioxide emissions from flying food around fresh food like tomatoes, it's horrifying, it's absolutely huge. So we can really make an impact on that. Um, we can make impacts regionally. So the uh, geopolitical benefits 
from our technologies are also very important because of uh, local employment, uh, diversifying uh, the, uh, the economic base within countries, and of course, providing food security, which people are very sensitive to at the moment because of the creaking, shall we say, of many of the global transport and logistics systems. Uh, the community impacts, of course, are, um, are, are I think, self-evident. The more fresh food we can provide people, the better their nutrition. In the process, we do employ quite a lot of people, and this really does provide opportunities for training and outreach um, of people. So we do increase education and, uh, and create jobs, which I think is, a, is, is an important benefit as well. So on that note, I'd just like to thank Ryan for being a fantastic <laughs> Collaborator, thank Murat and his team for being very, very hospitable here. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>